Welcome to today's live. I'm your host, Stafford Perkins. All right, uh, we're going to jump right into it. Today, we are taking a special, you know, continuation then. We're going to continue a topic we started last week, looking at the history, deep, deep, early history of Egypt, and to kind of figure out how did Europeans get to conquer Egypt. And um, with that, before we go any further, and for those who will come up on this live, I'm going to ask you to like it, share it, and subscribe. We need your, you know, for you to subscribe. We need for you to make comments also. I'm telling you, some people have been doing a great job in commenting, and I am very happy and pleased with what I'm seeing and what I'm getting. I don't think I want to talk to these people right now because I'm going live. I don't have time for this. So sorry about that. Somebody was trying to come into the program. But um, in fact, later on, I'll tell a story about what's going on here. In fact, cause me to start two minutes late, which is unlike me. Usually I'm on time. I've gone late a couple of times. Anyway, here we are. And we're going to go live. I'm going to just go to um, something here. To get us going and here we go Hey, here we go. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, thanks for coming on, for joining, for those who have joined or, or those who will join. I just want to say welcome. And again, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. Uh, today, again, we are going to take a look again at Egypt to see how, as I said before, how they came under European dominance. And um, we're going to try to look at even some of the years some of the things happened. And because Egypt is a multi-thousand-year-old um, society, a developed society, one who gave us a whole lot of what we use today, it gave us mathematics, it gave us astronomy, it gave us medicine, it gave us uh, algebra, all the things, all the tools, that they, all the calculations that were done to build the pyramids were actually done by the skill that these Egyptians had. Uh, so here I'm going to bring up a clip now to kind of just talk a little bit about Egypt. Many still believe that the indigenous Swahili and Somali civilizations were the creations of Arabs, not Africans. The Egyptian civilization has been recognized as the greatest in history for its advanced knowledge and technical achievements. Despite a UNESCO conference in 1974 okay. acknowledging its African roots, Egypt is still often portrayed as having a predominantly white heritage. This misrepresentation has led to a significant question. How did the people who were central to the development of these civilizations come to be seen as the very opposite of civilization? This video aims to trace the motivations behind this historical distortion and detail the process used in this misrepresentation. So when did the historical inaccuracies regarding the racial identity of the ancient Egyptians begin? Initially, the ancient Egyptians were commonly recognized as black people. This perception was evident in Roman mosaics dating from the 1st to 6th centuries CE and also in Byzantine art, such as the 11th century depiction of Sara, Abraham, and the Pharaoh. Many European and Arab writers from these periods acknowledged the ancient Egyptians as black. However, this accurate representation started to change during the High Middle Ages. This suggests that the shift in the portrayal of the ancient Egyptians' racial identity did not occur until many centuries later. Up until the Middle Ages, it was widely recognized that the ancient Egyptians were black. This view was supported by numerous European and Arab writers of that era. However, 
The distortion of this historical truth began much later. To fully understand this change, it's important to first examine a specific aspect of Western perspective that emerged around this time. It is important to recognize the historically violent nature of European Western culture, comparing it to other regions of the world. It's noted that Europe has been a particularly conflict ridden area, starting from ancient times with the Roman Empire through the Middle Ages with events like the Hundred Years War and the Crusades. All right, so here we go. Let me um, pull that down and I can come back to see myself. And we will um, just back out of that for now. Oh, man. Uh, sorry, I am still here. I, some changes were done to my thing today. And let me see if I can uh, hide it. Uh, that's what it said to do. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm using an, my uh, my interface. They made a, a switch on me and, and it happened in the afternoon, late afternoon, when I discovered it to say they switched and they, they did an upgrade, like a version 2.0, moving from whatever they were to 2.0. And um, so it's going to take me a little time to really master moving around the thing, but I, I'm seeing it. I'm getting there. All right. So welcome again. I'm your host, Stafford Perkins. Under the spotlight, this program is known as um it's on the channel just jamaica tv but we don't don't just look at J jamaica these days we're looking far and wide we're looking out in the african diaspora we're looking out in ancient um civilizations such as egypt hopefully we will get a chance to look at places like iran because that's also a very old um civilization we'd love to look to at the Middle East, well, what they call, um, what used to be Palestine, but now called Israel. We'd like to look deeper into that, and we will get there. We would like to focus some more on places like Ethiopia. I love Ethiopia. The history there is great also. And so I will be turning um, the spotlight on Ethiopia pretty soon after I've done, maybe, depends on how people react to this. People are, let me say this, a lot of people Loved what I did last week. I got a lot of responses, you know, positive, good, strong responses. And because of that, I say, you know what? I'm going to do some more on Egypt. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to cover in Egypt. And I'm glad that people are showing interest. And, and because once you show interest, then I will put the effort out and do the work. All right. So I'm going to put up another clip because I want to finish inviting um, people, friends, guests, whomever want to join. So give me a minute while we watch this next clip. The Greeks. One, the effects of the Persian conquest. A, immigration restrictions against the Greeks are removed and Egypt is thrown open to Greek research. Owing to the practice of piracy in which the Ionians and Carians were active, the Egyptians were forced to make immigration laws restricting the immigration of the Greeks and punishing their infringement by capital punishment, i.e. the sacrifice of the victim. Before the time of Semiticus, the Greeks were not allowed to go beyond the coast of Lower Egypt, but during his reign and that of Amasis, those conditions were modified. For the first time in Egyptian history, Ionians and Carians were employed as mercenaries in the Egyptian army, 670 BC. Interpretation was organized through a body of interpreters and the Greeks began to gain useful information concerning the culture of the Egyptians. In addition to these changes, King Amasis removed the restrictions against the Greeks and permitted them to enter Egypt and settle in Nacratus. About the same time, i.e. the reign of Amasis, the Persians, through Cambyses, invaded Egypt and the whole country was thrown open to the researches of the Greeks. B. The Genesis of Greek Enlightenment The Persian invasion did not only provide the Greeks with ample research, but stimulated the creation of prose history in Ionia. Heretofore, the Greeks had little or no accurate knowledge of Egyptian culture, but their contact with Egypt resulted in the genesis of their enlightenment. C. Students from Ionia and the islands of the Aegean visit Egypt for their education. Just as in our modern times, countries like the United States, England, and France are attracting students from all parts of the world on account of their leadership and culture. So it was in ancient times. Egypt was supreme in leadership of civilization, 
and students from all parts flocked to that land, seeking admission into her mysteries or wisdom system. The immigration of Greeks into Egypt for the purpose of their education began as a result of the Persian invasion, 525 BC, and continued until the Greeks gained possession of that land and access to the Royal Library through the conquest of Alexander the Great. Alexandria was converted into a Greek city, a center of research and the capital of a newly created Greek empire under the rule of the Ptolemies. Egyptian culture survived and flourished under the name and control of the Greeks until the edicts of Theodosius in the 4th century AD and that of Justinian in the 6th century AD, which closed the mystery temples and schools as elsewhere mentioned. Concerning the fact that Egypt was the greatest education center of the ancient world, which was also visited by the Greeks, reference must again be made to Plato in the Timaeus, who tells us that Greek aspirants to wisdom visited Egypt for initiation and that the priests of Sais used to refer to them as children in the mysteries. As regards the visit of Greek students to Egypt for the purpose of their education, the following are mentioned simply to establish the fact that Egypt was regarded as the educational center of the ancient world and that like the Jews, the Greeks also visited Egypt and received their education. One, it is said that during the reign of Amasis, Thales, who is said to have been born about 585 BC, visited Egypt and was initiated by the Egyptian priests into the mystery system and science of the Egyptians. We are also told that during his residence in Egypt, he learned astronomy, land surveying, mensuration, engineering, and Egyptian theology. Two, it is said that Pythagoras, a native of Samos, traveled frequently to Egypt for the purpose of his education. Like every aspirant, he had to secure the consent and favor of the priests. And we are informed by Diogenes that a friendship existed between Polycrates of Samos and Amasis, king of Egypt. That Polycrates gave Pythagoras letters of introduction to the king, who secured for him an introduction to the priests. First to the priests of Heliopolis, then to the priests of Memphis, and lastly to the priests of Thebes, to each of whom Pythagoras gave a silver goblet. We are also further informed through Herodotus, Chablonsk, and Pliny, that after severe trials, including circumcision, had been imposed upon him by the Egyptian priests, he was finally initiated into all their secrets, that he learned the doctrine of metempsychosis, of which there was no trace before in the Greek religion, that his knowledge of medicine and strict system of dietic rules distinguished him as a product of Egypt, where medicine had attained its highest perfection, and that his attainments in geometry corresponded with the ascertained fact that Egypt was the birthplace of that science. In addition, we have the statements of Plutarch, Demetrius, and Antisthenes that Pythagoras founded the science of mathematics among the Greeks, and that he sacrificed to the Muses when the priests explained to him the properties of the right angle triangle. Pythagoras was also trained in music by the Egyptian priests. 3. According to Diogenes Laertes and Herodotus, Democritus is said to have been born about 400 BC and to have been a native of Abdera in Miletus. We are also told by Demetrius in his treatise on, quote, people of the same name, end quote, and by Antisthenes in his treatise on succession, that Democritus traveled to Egypt for the purpose of his education and received the instruction of the priests. We also learn from Diogenes and Herodotus that he spent five years under the instruction of the Egyptian priests and that after completion of his education, he wrote a treatise on the sacred characters of Moreau. In this respect, we further learn from Origen that circumcision was compulsory and one of the necessary conditions of initiation to a knowledge of the hieroglyphics and sciences of the Egyptians. And it is obvious that Democritus, in order to obtain such knowledge, must have submitted also to that right. Origen, who was a native of Egypt, wrote as follows, quote, No one among the Egyptians either studied geometry or investigated the secrets of astronomy unless circumcision had been undertaken, end quote. Four, concerning Plato's travels, we are told by Hermodorus that at the age of 28, Plato visited Euclid at Megara in company with other pupils of Socrates, and that for the next 10 years, he visited Cyrene, Italy, and finally Egypt, where he received instruction from the Egyptian priests. Five, with regards to Socrates and Aristotle and the majority of the pre-Socratic philosophers, history seems to be silent on the question of their traveling to Egypt like the few other students here mentioned for the purpose of their education. It is enough to say that in this case, the exceptions have proved the rule that all students who had the means went to Egypt to complete their education. 
The fact that history fails to supply a full account of this type of immigration might be due to some or all of the following reasons. A. The immigration laws against the Greeks up to the time of King Amasis and the Persian invasion. All right. Um, let me see now that I have to find my way back. As I said, I am kind of figuring it out on the fly. This is I maximize. They did a switcheroo on me today, and so I am kind of figuring it out as I go, how to move around the, this uh, upgraded interface. And, um, but I'll, you know, as the program goes along, I'll get better um, by actually doing the thing. All right, so this evening again, as we said, we are looking again at this, the story of Egypt how how a con how a, a, a civilization we can't even think of it just as a country we have to see it and think about it as a civilization the civilization which pretty much gave us all the things we know today the thing of studying going to a university coming out with um with a specialty and because they had written the book and everything i want to say the books and everything that mankind presently uses to do anything to do whether you know to walk run ride travel all of it is come through the usage or the application of the mathematics which they gave to us the geometry which they used to build tall structures because they were the first to build these tall structures, the pyramids. And Egypt was a place that it was locked off from the rest of the world for a long time. In fact, if in the report just, that just went by, if you were paying attention, you'd notice that you could be put to sleep. Let me put a nice word there. You could be put to sleep for, you know, I would want to say climbing over the fence the way we see some people climbing over the fence these days to come into a certain country. But along, you know, along the way, the, the, the pharaohs, they, you know, with a new pharaoh, it's just the way you have a new president and a new president or a different, you know, each president will have their own way, style and way of doing things. And it came down to a point where they started easing up on this immigration thing. And the Greece, the Greeks are uh, Greece, the country Greece, which is closest to them. They were coming to Egypt, but they would come to the coast. They wouldn't allow them to come in. So they were able to keep themselves safe for a long time. But somewhere in there, they started putting, letting down their guards and they started letting in the Greeks. And the Greeks were actually a part of the Roman Empire. Because Alexander, I like to say the so-called great, Alexander the Great, he actually came from a place which is part of what is now called Macedonia. Uh, I'm from a, from a kind of a, a, a kingdom or something called Macedon up there in Europe. He was born there. And he actually, because Greece was a part of that kingdom, under Alexander, under what we become eventually become the Roman Empire. Because Greece fell under that, that empire, they were used by the empire to infiltrate, to get up when once once HR started changing the rules, they were able to infiltrate and get up into, into um, Egypt. In fact, they said one of the emperors even employed them as mercenaries in the army and that they were actually plants you know in, in that european area there was something um part of that hellenic what they call the hellenic period uh if you ever, those of you who have been into european history you hear about you hear about helen of troy and those kind of things one of the tricks that they used in one of those wars because those people were always at wars those europeans they were always at war and one of the wars that they fought, 
in the Hellenic period was where they pulled a wooden horse into the gates of a city. And inside of that wooden horse were soldiers hiding out. And they, at night, in the night, they came out of the wooden horse and they opened the gate and you know of the city and let in the invading forces. So they what they did with Egypt, uh, what they did, yes, what they did to Egypt was he used the Greeks who knew of that type of tactics in world warfare, and they got them to become up, get into the system, even become part of the military and all kinds of things, and they started like leaking the secrets, and that was the beginning of the end for that thing they call the Egyptian um, dynasty, because they were like, you know, they were, it was a dynasty, pharaohs after pharaoh after pharaoh, sometimes they call themselves king, and many times they would say pharaoh, but they interchange it. And then once they, uh, once they, the Europeans now, they got into, into, in, into Egypt, they started tearing the place apart. Um, in fact, there was another society which infiltrated in the in the um, the Egyptian system was the one they call the Persians, the Persian Empire, which is now what is left of it now is Iran. That's a very old and another very old society, and they too had penetrated. Um, the system and got into into um, Iran, into sorry, into Egypt. I'm going to play another play another tape, and then I'm going to try to bring up something to give a chronological report on how the play went between, say, um, Ira, um, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire with Alexander the Great. So let me go to one of my clips that I have here, and then while that is playing, I'm going to set up something. Alexander were used as a university. The Museum and Library of Alexandria were so famous in ancient times that we wonder why more information concerning this center of learning has not come down to us. A few references to authoritative sources might no doubt help to enlighten us on this matter. From Sedgwick's and Tyler's History of Science, Chapter 5, pages 87 through 119, we learn that the subjugation of Egypt by Alexander the Great in 330 BC had checked the further development of, of Greek civilization on its native soil that after the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, his vast empire was divided among his generals and that Alexandria, the new Egyptian capital, fell to Ptolemy. That the city, barely 10 years old, soon became the center of the learned world and that by 300 BC, the museum, i.e. the seat of the muses, was founded and became a veritable university of Greek learning. That to the museum was attached a great library with a dining hall and lecture rooms for professors and this became a school of philosophers, mathematicians, and astronomers. Here for the next 700 years, science had its chief abiding place. Here, however, it should be remembered that the above statement of Sedgwick and Tyler is misleading, since the Greeks did not carry a civilization of their own to Egypt, but on the contrary found a very highly developed Egyptian culture, the survival of which was maintained by the use of Egyptian priests and scholars as teachers. D. A military policy of the Greeks to commandeer information from the Egyptians was put into operation. One of the military policies adopted by the Greek military authorities at Alexandria was the issue of commands to the leading Egyptian priests for information concerning the Egyptian history, philosophy, and religion. As a custom to this is no less ancient than modern, since it is also a custom in modern times for victorious armies to confer with the men of science of the invaded country in order to discover whether or not there is anything new in the field of science which they might possess. We will recall how at the end of World War II, the American scientists conferred with the Japanese scientists at Tokyo. Accordingly, we are told that Ptolemy I Soter, in order to elicit the secrets of Egyptian wisdom or mystery system, ordered Manetho, the high priest of the Temple of Isis at Sevenitas in Lower Egypt to write the philosophy and the history of the religion of the Egyptians. 
Accordingly, Manetho published several volumes concerning these respective fields, and Ptolemy issued an order prohibiting the translation of these books, which had to be kept on reserve in the library for instruction of the Greeks by the Egyptian priests. Here it becomes quite clear that the first professors of the Alexandrian school were the Egyptian priests and that the scholars and pupils of Aristotle's transferred school received their training directly from the Egyptian priests. It is also well to note that the chief textbooks of the Alexandrian school were Manetho's books. We are told by Apollodorus, from whom Sincellus drew his information, that Ptolemy II ordered Erosthenes, the Cyrenian, i.e. a black man and native of Cyrene, and librarian of the Alexandrian library to write a chronology of the Theban kings, and that Aristosthenes did so with the aid of the Egyptian hierophants at Thebes. Furthermore, it became the custom during the Greek and Roman occupation to use the services of Egyptian priests and scholars as professors at the Alexandrian school. We are told that during the reign of Theodosius, 378 to 395 AD, the Egyptian professor Horopalo wrote a system of the Egyptian hieroglyphics. The hieroglyphica of Horopalo, which has been regarded as the best that has come down to modern times. We are told that this professor taught not only at the Alexandrian school, but also at that of Constantinople. All right. So now let me um, do my thing here again and see if I can get out. <laughs> uh, hide that. Okay. All right. So as as you just heard um of course they everybody from wherever mainly europe they went to to um egypt to get their education you know because there was the kind of development that was in europe was no match you know for what they had seen in in egypt and they did what they had to do and they broke through the defenses and they got into into thing i, I want to do a little a quick report on something i hope it comes over to look at who came first in the conquest of egypt all right so bear with me a little ah uh, i hope the um the audio is on oh yeah sorry about that I think my audio was off. I think this is a sound is on, so I don't know why it's not coming up. So I'm going to do this again. Sorry about that. Yeah. So let me let me do a little talk here and, until I get back to this thing because the sound went off, and I don't know why it didn't come up. Hope it's not. I know I turned this off. All right, one, one second, let me get this back. Give me a second, copy, select all, and copy. I'm going to do this again, and hopefully it comes up. I'm calling on my AI to do the, calling AI, okay, to do some reporting. The Persians things. conquered Egypt first. Egypt was conquered by the Persian Empire in 525 BC under the rule of Cambyses II, the son of Cyrus the Great. The Persians ruled over Egypt until the conquest of Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Alexander the Great, also known as Alexander III of Macedon, was a king of the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon. He was born in 356 BC and became king at the age of 20 after his father, King Philip II, was assassinated. Alexander is considered one of the greatest military commanders in history. He is known for his military campaigns that resulted in the creation of one of the largest empires of the ancient world, stretching from Greece to Egypt and as far east as India. Alexander's conquests had a profound impact on the cultures and civilizations of the regions he conquered. He died in 323 BC at the age of 32. All right, so I kind of wanted to get that report mainly to say who came first. So it wasn't Alexander for Alexander the Great who first who conquered Egypt. It was the Persians. And I think with Egypt under occupation by the Persians and Alexander having a very strong army, it was then the natural thing for the Egyptians to do was to make an alliance with 
with, with, with um, Alexander and to liberate them from the Persians. Because the Persians were like really, you know, robbing them, working them, and just taking everything from them and the Persians. So they saw the opportunity to get relief from, from, um, from the Persians and they, they collaborated with Alexander. And so he, he was a conqueror, a great conqueror in his own right, of course. He was taking over pretty much most of the, the known world. And it, so it was natural. And uh, there was a, a report that I, you know, well, I, I'll try to paraphrase to say that the reason why the importance of Egypt to somebody like Alexander was the passageway in that area of Egypt where it, you connect, where eventually they built that Suez Canal thing, the passageway to get from one side to the next, you know, of the world. And it was, it gave you that extra power when you, it's just the same way we see in modern day, um, what they call um, geopolitics, where you see America tries to get into North Africa and they might try to get into Central Africa and they try to get into South Africa and the Russians will try to do the same thing to the point there's a place just off the coast of Africa, um, Djibouti, which they have pretty much a port for all of the so-called powers of the world, the Chinese, the, the, the Indians, the, the, the Americans and the Russians, they don't just allow one person to take over. They, they give everybody a space and say, that is yours, you can be here. And then they, they get money from it, of course. So people are always jockeying, even from back then, they were always jockeying to, to get control of you know, strategic places that helps them to you know, carry out their whatever it is they want, whatever mandate they want, they, they were able to, to, you know, manipulate and to get conquer most of the times. Like for, for instance, Egypt was coming under constant attack, constant attempt to invade. It was a constant struggle to stay there. And eventually um, it happened that they took over. So, and then, so um, with that, what they did when the Europeans took over, they just stripped that place literally bare and uh and and it became it became um the eventual when they took so much of it they just moved in took over the place switched up things the way they were they used to have these great libraries at, at you know in 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 the center of um the capital of whatever was egypt at the time there's another city another great city named thebes memphis all those cities were there and all of them had libraries and during the time during the in, or in during times of conquest in any in, in, in any period when one side conquered another side what they will go in and do is to take away the treasures take away anything that has to do that you consider that this is a heritage of the people the language, the books, if they have books, are, they may have um, symbols that they use, religious symbols. For instance, there is a, a bench that they would, a stool that they took from Ghana, that there was a struggle still to get. There's even a struggle still to get back one of those stools because these stools have very high spiritual importance to them. So in Egypt, with all of that knowledge, when they went in there, they just went to see, went to work, and they stripped the place, literally beer. Let me see if I can get in here. All right, we're doing pretty good with the time. Um, I want to just say to each and everyone who is was joined on, I want to say thank you for joining on. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to try to get through as much of this um, that I have to talk about this evening. Maybe it's not the, it's not the topic of some people some people like to hear about you know the, the local stuff but i'm giving i'm giving that one a, a bit of a wide circle for a while <laughs> um because there are a lot more things to talk about than you know people doing silly things and not doing the right thing you know oh in fact let me say this i want to do a little promo for tomorrow is that a tomorrow monday or tuesday i saw somebody did an article on housing 
yes, the housing situation in Jamaica, and I would like to put back my stamp on it. I would, let me say, Lisa Hannah did an article. I read the article. She talked about some things, and there are some things that I think I could add to that article, and I want to take it on and, you know, possibly say some things on it and to add things to it because it's a very important thing in Jamaica that whoever is in charge right now, they don't seem to have an idea how to go about um, working working it out, you know, to build enough houses, to build 200 houses and they, they, you know, making a big excitement. But anyway, that's, that's right now it's just a, a break to promote a program that I'm bringing. I'm hoping to do it tomorrow. If not tomorrow, it's going to be Tuesday. I want to come and bring something and talk about that housing thing in Jamaica. All right, so we're going back. Again, I want to say thank you for joining. And we're going to ask those who are on to like, subscribe, comment. And if you see that bell, you know, hit that bell. It's a notification that when I, 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 you know, when I come on, you will be notified that I'm on. So hit the notification bell that you can become part of the, the thing and you will be notified when I'm on. Because I do appear up sometimes in the middle of the week, and if you are, if you are, if you have joined on, or you hit that notification, you will be notified. All right, so let's go back to the Egyptian thing. Let me go to a tape. In fact, let me go to the video tape and bring up something so you don't get just me alone talking. Just give me one second while I do this. I think I did that one. Let's go to another one. This group consisted of Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. One, Thales. Thales is supposed to have lived 620 to 546 BC, and a native of Miletus is credited by Aristotle with teaching that A, water is the source of all living things, B, all things are full of God. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Thales arrived at his conclusions except that Aristotle attempts to offer his opinion as a reason. That is that Thales must have been influenced by the consideration of the moisture of the nutriment and based his conclusion on the rationalistic interpretation of the myth of Oceanus. This, however, is regarded as mere conjecture on the part of Aristotle. 2. Anaximander Anaximander, supposed to have been born 610 BC at Miletus, is credited with teaching that the origin of all things is the infinite or the unlimited, i.e. a peron or the boundless. The aperon is regarded as equivalent to the modern notion of space and the mythological notion of chaos. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Anaximander arrived at his conclusions. But here again, we find Aristotle offering his opinion as a reason, i.e. that Anaximander must have supposed that change destroys matter and that unless the substratum of change is limitless, change must at some time cease. This opinion is, of course, mere conjecture on the part of Aristotle. 3. Anaximenes Also a native of Miletus and supposed to have died in 528 BC, is credited with teaching that all things originated from air. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Anaximenes arrived at his conclusion and all attempts to furnish a reason are regarded as mere conjecture. 2. Pythagoras Born in the Aegean island of Samos, supposedly in 530 BC, the following doctrines have been attributed to Pythagoras. 1. Transmigration The immortality of the soul and salvation. This salvation is based upon certain beliefs concerning the soul. True life is not to be found here on earth, and what men call life is really death and the body is the tomb of the soul. Owing to the contamination caused by the soul's imprisonment in the body, it is forced to pass through an indefinite series of reincarnations from the body of one animal to that of another until it is purged from such contamination. Salvation, in this sense, consists of the freedom of the soul from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, which is common to every soul, and which condition must remain until purification or purgation is completed. Being liberated from the ten chains of the flesh and also from successive reincarnations, the soul now acquires her pristine perfection and the eligibility to join the company of the gods with whom she dwells forever. This was the reward which the Pythagorean system offered its initiates. 
the doctrines of A, opposites, B, the summum bonum, or supreme good, and C, the process of purification. A, the union of opposites. The union of opposites creates harmony in the universe. This is true in the case of musical sounds, such as we find in the lyre, where the harmony produced is the result of the mean proportional relation between the length of two middle strings to that of two extremes. This is also true in natural phenomena, which are identified with number, whose elements consist of the odd and the even. The even is unlimited because of its quality of unlimited divisibility, and the odd indicates limitation, while the product of both is the unit or harmony. Similarly, do we obtain harmony in the union of positive and negative, male and female, material and immaterial, body and soul? B. The summum bonum or supreme good. The summum bonum or supreme good in man is to become God. All right. I think I, I want to take a break out of that one for now. On oh, hide. This group consisted of Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. 1. Thales. Thales is supposed to have lived 620 to 546 BC, and a native of Miletus is credited by Aristotle with teaching that A. Water is the source of all living things. B. All things are full of God. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Thales arrived at his conclusions except that Aristotle attempts to offer his opinion as a reason. That is that Thales must have been influenced by the consideration of the moisture of the nutriment and based his conclusion on the rationalistic interpretation of the myth of Oceanus. This, however, is regarded as mere conjecture on the part of Aristotle. 2. Anaximander Anaximander, supposed to have been born 610 BC at Miletus, is credited with teaching that the origin of all things is the infinite, or the unlimited, i.e. a peron, or the boundless. The aperon is regarded as equivalent to the modern notion of space and the mythological notion of chaos. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Anaximander arrived at his conclusions. But here again we find Aristotle offering his opinion as a reason, i.e. that Anaximander must have supposed that change destroys matter, and that unless the substratum of change is limitless, change must at some time cease. This opinion is, of course, mere conjecture on the part of Aristotle. 3. Anaximenes. Also a native of Miletus and supposed to have died in 528 BC, is credited with teaching that all things originated from air. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Anaximenes arrived at his conclusion and all attempts to furnish a reason are regarded as mere conjecture. 2. Pythagoras Born in the Aegean island of Samos, supposedly in 530 BC, the following doctrines have been attributed to Pythagoras. 1. Transmigration The immortality of the soul and salvation. This salvation is based upon certain beliefs concerning the soul. True life is not to be found here on earth, and what men call life is really death and the body is the tomb of the soul. Owing to the contamination caused by the soul's imprisonment in the body, it is forced to pass through an indefinite series of reincarnations from the body of one animal to that of another until it is purged from such contamination. 
Salvation, in this sense, consists of the freedom of the soul from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, which is common to every soul, and which condition must remain until purification or purgation is completed. Being liberated from the ten chains of the flesh, and also from successive reincarnations, the soul now acquires her pristine perfection and the eligibility to join the company of the gods with whom she dwells forever. This was the reward which the Pythagorean system offered its initiates. The doctrines of A, opposites, B, the summum bonum, or supreme good, and C, the process of purification. A, the union of opposites. The union of opposites creates harmony in the universe. This is true in the case of musical sounds, such as we find in the lyre, where the harmony produced is the result of the mean proportional relation between the length of two middle strings to that of two extremes. This is also true in natural phenomena, which are identified with number, whose elements consist of the odd and the even. The even is unlimited because of its quality of unlimited divisibility, and the odd indicates limitation, while the product of both is the unit or harmony. Similarly, do we obtain harmony in the union of positive and negative, male and female, material and immaterial, body and soul? B. The summum bonum or supreme good. The summum bonum or supreme good in man is to become God. Alexander the Great, Aristotle's school, and succeeding Ptolemies converted the Royal Library of Alexandria into a research center by transferring Aristotle's school and pupils from Athens to this great Egyptian library, and therefore the students who studied there received instructions from Egyptian priests and teachers until they died out. The difficulty of language and interpretation made it imperative for the Greeks to use Egyptian teachers. The Greeks did not carry culture and learning to Egypt, but found it already there and wisely settled in that country in order to absorb as much as possible of its culture. B. The Royal Library of Thebes, the Meneptian, is described. It was also looted by invading armies. But when we read of a brief sketch of the magnificence of the Theban Royal Library, the Meneptian, we even see a better picture and are bound to admit that Egypt was the storehouse of ancient culture and that the culture was preserved in the form of literature stored away in her great libraries and temples. Great as the Royal Library of Alexandria might have been, we see in the Theban Royal Library something far more magnificent and far more representative of the true greatness of our ancient Egypt. On the left of the steps leading to the second court, there is still seen the pedestal of the enormous granite statue of Ramses, the largest that has ever existed in Egypt, according to Diodorus. Its height has been calculated at 54 feet and its weight at 887 quarter tons a marvel to the modern mind. The interior face of the wall of the pylon represents the wars of Ramses III. The oricide pillars of the second court are the monolithial figures, 16 cubits in height, supplying the place of columns, and at the foot of the steps leading from the court to the next hall beyond, there were two sitting statues of the king. The head of one of these was of red granite, known by the name of Young Memon, was taken away by Belzoni, and is now a principal ornament of the British Museum. Beyond this are the remains of a hall 133 feet broad by 100 feet long, supported by 48 columns, 12 of which are 32 feet in height and 21 feet in circumference. On the different parts of the columns and the walls are represented acts of homage by the king to the principal deities of the Theban pantheon and the gracious promises which they make him in return. In another sculpture, the two chief divinities of Egypt invest him with the emblems of military and civil dominion, i.e. the scimitar, the scourge, and the pedum. 
beneath the 23 sons of Ramses appear in procession bearing the emblems of their respective high office in the state, their names being inscribed above them. Nine smaller apartments, two of them still preserved and supported by columns, lay behind the hall. On the jams of the first of these apartments are sculptured Thoth, the inventor of letters, and the goddess Saf, with the title of Lady of Letters, and President of the Hall of Books, accompanied the former with an emblem of the sense of sight and the latter of hearing. There is no doubt that this is the sacred library which Diodorus describes in the inscribed Dispensary of the Mind. It had an astronomical ceiling in which the 12 Egyptian months are represented, with an inscription from which important inferences have been drawn respecting the chronology of the reign of Ramses III. On the wall is a procession of priests carrying the sacred arts, and in the next apartment, the last that now remains, the king is presenting offerings to the various divinities. C. Museum and the Library of Alexander were used as a university. This group consisted of Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. 1. Thales. Thales is supposed to have lived 620 to 546 BC, and a native of Miletus is credited by Aristotle with teaching that A. Water is the source of all living things. B. All things are full of God. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Thales arrived at his conclusions except that Aristotle attempts to offer his opinion as a reason. That is that Thales must have been influenced by the consideration of the moisture of the nutriment and based his conclusion on the rationalistic interpretation of the myth of Oceanus. This, however, is regarded as mere conjecture on the part of Aristotle. 2. Anaximander Anaximander, supposed to have been born 610 BC at Miletus, is credited with teaching that the origin of all things is the infinite or the unlimited, i.e. a peron or the boundless. The aperon is regarded as equivalent to the modern notion of space and the mythological notion of chaos. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Anaximander arrived at his conclusions. But here again, we find Aristotle offering his opinion as a reason, i.e. that Anaximander must have supposed that change destroys matter and that unless the substratum of change is limitless, change must at some time cease. This opinion is, of course, mere conjecture on the part of Aristotle. 3. Anaximenes Also a native of Miletus and supposed to have died in 528 BC, is credited with teaching that all things originated from air. Both history and tradition are silent as to how Anaximenes arrived at his conclusion and all attempts to furnish a reason are regarded as mere conjecture. 2. Pythagoras Born in the Aegean island of Samos, supposedly in 530 BC, the following doctrines have been attributed to Pythagoras. 1. Transmigration The immortality of the soul and salvation. This salvation is based upon certain beliefs concerning the soul. True life is not to be found here on earth, and what men call life is really death and the body is the tomb of the soul. Owing to the contamination caused by the soul's imprisonment in the body, it is forced to pass through an indefinite series of reincarnations 
from the body of one animal to that of another until it is purged from such contamination. Salvation, in this sense, consists of the freedom of the soul from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, which is common to every soul, and which condition must remain until purification or purgation is completed. Being liberated from the ten chains of the flesh, and also from successive reincarnations, the soul now acquires her pristine perfection and the eligibility to join the company of the gods with whom she dwells forever. This was the reward which the Pythagorean system offered its initiates. The doctrines of A, opposites, B, the summum bonum, or supreme good, and C, the process of purification. A, the union of opposites. The union of opposites creates harmony in the universe. This is true in the case of musical sounds, such as we find in the lyre, where the harmony produced is the result of the mean proportional relation between the length of two middle strings to that of two extremes. This is also true in natural phenomena, which are identified with number, whose elements consist of the odd and the even. The even is unlimited because of its quality of unlimited divisibility, and the odd indicates limitation, while the product of both is the unit or harmony. Similarly, do we obtain harmony in the union of positive and negative, male and female, material and immaterial, body and soul? B. The summum bonum or supreme good. The summum bonum or supreme good in man is to become God. This group consisted of Thales, Anaximander, and regards to Socrates and Aristotle and the majority of the pre-Socratic philosophers, history seems to be silent on the question of their traveling to Egypt like the few other students here mentioned for the purpose of their education. It is enough to say that in this case, the, the exceptions have proved the rule that all students who had the means went to Egypt to complete their education. The fact that history fails to supply a fuller account of this type of immigration might be due to some or all of the following reasons. A. The immigration laws against the Greeks up to the time of King Amasis and the Persian invasion. B. Prose history was undeveloped among the Greeks during the period of their educational immigration to Egypt. C. The Greek authorities persecuted and drove students of philosophy into hiding and consequently, D. Students of the mystery system concealed their movements. Let us remember that Anaxagoras was indicted and imprisoned and that he escaped and fled to his home in Ionia that Socrates was indicted, imprisoned, and condemned to death, and that both Plato and Aristotle fled from Athens under great suspicion. Two, the effects of the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great. A, as elsewhere mentioned, it was an ancient custom of invading armies to loot libraries and temples in order to capture books and manuscripts, which were regarded as great treasures. A few instances would be enough to verify this custom. A, 
we are informed that during the Persian invasion, beginning with Cambyses, the temples of Egypt were not only stripped of their gold and silver, but rifled for their ancient records. Every Egyptian temple carried a secret library with secret manuscripts and books. B. We are also informed that when Athens was captured by the Romans in 84 BC, the library of books said to have belonged to Aristotle was also captured and taken to Rome. Just as the invasion of Egypt by the Persians, the invading army stripped the temples of their gold, silver, and sacred books. And just as the capture of Athens by the Romans, Sulla carried off the only library of books which he found, so it is to be expected of Alexander the Great in his invasion of Egypt. One of the first things that he and his companions and armies would do would be to search for the treasures of the land and capture them. These were kept in temples and libraries and consisted of gold and silver, out of which the gods and ceremonial vessels were made, and sacred books and manuscripts kept both in libraries and in the holy of holies of temples. It is my firm belief that this indeed was the great opportunity which Alexander gave Aristotle and enabled him and his pupils to carry off as many books as they wanted from the Royal Library and to convert it into a research center. Apart from the Royal Library at Alexandria, there was also another famous library nearby, the Royal Library of Thebes, the Meneptian, which was founded by Pharaoh Setae. The Meneptian was completed by Ramses II, but little occurs in history about this greatest of Egyptian royal libraries. However, any invading army would first loot the Royal Library of Alexandria and then would turn their attention to the Meneptian at Thebes. They would also visit the cities of Memphis and Heliopolis and likewise loot their libraries and temples. This was the ancient custom and certainly one of the ways in which the Greeks received their education from Egyptians. It is therefore an erroneous belief that the Greeks on Egyptian soil and through their own native ability, set up a great university at Alexandria and turned out great scholars. On the other hand, since it is a well-known fact that Egypt was the land of temples and libraries, we can see how comparatively easy it was for the Greeks to strip other Egyptian libraries of their books in order to maintain the new library at Alexandria after it had been already looted by Aristotle and his pupils. The Greek